Hey, is this thing on? Are we recording? Can I get a tech person? Oh, for the love of ed tech. Joining us today is Joel Cooperstein, Senior Vice President of Product Strategy for Learning A to Z. So, hey, Joel, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. It's great to be with you. Yeah, and we're curious, now that you're at A to Z, how did you even get into education to begin with? Hmm. Well, I only ever wanted to be a teacher growing up. My my mother was a math teacher back in the 1930s. Uh, my, my, my grandmother was a math teacher back in the 1930s. My mom, on the other side, was a kindergarten teacher when I showed up. And it's just sort of in me. If you if you're a teacher, you just kind of know it. You don't really choose mm-hmm. it. You just kind of are. And I figured out pretty early on that that was for me. And so that's what I studied to be. I taught elementary school for a little while, much too short of a time, a little bit of time in upper elementary, four fifth okay. combo, and then finished at third grade, which I love. I love third graders. Mm-hmm. They're a perfect. You love eight year old. If you know, you know. Mm-hmm. And just serendipitously found my way into print publishing many years ago. And then one door opens and leads to another. And I've been in publishing and educational technology for 25 plus years at this point, having worked on early literacy materials during the No Child Left Behind era, having worked on some math intervention stuff over the years, I've seen the whole evolution into print, from print into digital and, and where we are now. And it's been a ride. Yeah, for sure. Ever evolving and ever changing. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, which brings me to can you explain a little bit about the science of reading and the big hype about it? Because I feel like this is one of those things where it was a trend, it fell out of trend, and now it's back in trend, but it wasn't always called the science of reading. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a semantic overlay and then there's the reality of what it is people are talking about. Uh, Mm -hmm. And the underlying point is that there is some really robust, important and useful research that teaches us how kids uh, are best taught to read. So the science of reading is really the science of teaching reading. Uh, What are the most efficacious ways to teach kids uh, literacy skills? And as far as it being a trend or not a trend, I mean, I mentioned that when I kind of came into this work, it was right around the time of No Child Left Behind in, in the early 2000s. And that it was the same premise. There's all this research out there. We should follow it. We shouldn't be guessing. We can actually know uh, what's most effective when it comes to uh, pedagogical approaches for kids. And it took hold pretty firmly then. And then like a lot of things, gets subjectively interpreted and implemented. And so it diffused a little bit and it didn't really have as as much of an uptake as we might have hoped. And there was still a little bit of disparity or interpretation in methodologies. And here we are 20 years later where the, the point is still the same. Don't forget there is research out there that helps us inform how we teach kids most effectively when it comes to literacy. And it's a response to, I mean, a whole bunch of things. One of those is that there are some methodologies that have been pretty prominent that didn't follow the, that those the the findings mm-hmm. from research and we want teachers to make sure they're doing that in addition the pandemic shed this gigantic light on all aspects of of education in the united states and around the world and really made us even more hyper aware of what's working and what's not working than than we had been i think and you know refocusing us on the research and making sure that we're following these best practices. It's important to note, though, that science of research is not a program and it's not a single pedagogy. It's an idea that there is scientific research that informs the best way to teach reading and we should follow it. And it changes all the time Mm -hmm. and it will continue to change. And it's going to vary with kids' needs to some degree. And that's where it becomes nuanced and and tricky and very skill dependent on the teacher's part. But there, it's it's just that make sure that what you're doing is grounded in research. Right. Yeah. So where does ed tech, do you think, fit into this picture of literacy and reading? 
EdTech's responsibility is the enablement and empowerment of teachers to bring those techniques forward into their classroom with as much efficiency and precision as possible. And those are two carefully chosen words, efficiency and precision. Precision is the idea that technology enables teachers to have pretty exact information about what kids know, don't know, and are ready to learn at any given moment, or can anyway. And it can also help teachers know what to do with that information through the data it collects and visualizes and reports out. Efficiency has to do with time, you know, right. because kids are changing constantly. So, you know, there's no more dynamic environment than a classroom, as yeah. you guys know, and I'm sure all the listeners know. And so being able to respond to those needs with precision and efficiency speed matters a lot. So rather than having to wait some number of hours or days or even longer to respond to what a student is indicating she needs to know or is ready to learn, we can know much faster than that by being tech enabled. So in a nutshell, educational technology's job is to make teachers incredible. It's, it's not to replace them and it's not to provide a proxy or anything like that. It, teachers need to know and most already know what it takes to be amazing, to have the outcomes that they desire to have. EdTech is tools. You know, it, it's, they're resources that we can offer in content, functionality, and features to, to, to empower them to, to be better faster. And it's in many ways not that different from everybody who tries to participate in this market. We have, we have a particular skill set, competency that makes us uniquely qualified to be an essential part of every classroom in that we have created really fantastic, high quality literacy experiences, reading experiences for kids that enable them to, uh, to always have something that they're interested in, that they are familiar, you know, familiar with or, or want to chase, uh, as well as supporting teachers' best practices. So while there are some companies who focus their educational technology on unmediated experiences between the student and the screen, learning A to Z is about the teacher and giving the teacher resources that she can employ, a deploy as she needs to meet the specific needs of each one of her students, whether that's working with them as an entire class with small groups of kids or giving them independent work, she has those choices as opposed to a piece of software that sits in the back of the classroom and you tell the kids go spend 20 minutes on that and it'll do whatever it does and you might look at the reports later that's more of a unmediated experience for kids and we're all about empowering the teacher the teacher really is in the center of of our way of thinking mm. about driving outcomes in classrooms so is the focus differentiation so that they are able to select kind of what each learner is experiencing? Yeah. So, I mean, that, the ultimate goal of every classroom is to give every child what they need at the right time, the right resource at the right time for the right kid. And right. that's the ultimate challenge of teaching. Educational technology resources must empower that. And, you know, maybe you'd say that the ideal scenario in a classroom is that every child has the attention of the teacher every minute of every day. We know that's not feasible, but technology can enable the teacher to have a lot more knowledge in more moments of the day of what each child knows, doesn't know, and is ready to learn. And that's what that's what we aim to do. And yes, ultimately that's differentiation. We know that whole group instruction is useful for introducing ideas and providing modeling but it's not the best way to get each individual student to the learning outcomes you're, you're pursuing. You really do at some point have to get in there and differentiate what it is you're, you're instructing them with, what they're practicing on, what you're assessing them on. So Learning A to Z is the company. Our flagship product is Reading A to Z, which is a suite of products, which includes the RAS Plus and Kids A to Z. And it's, it's a suite, it's a, a library of resources that, yeah, that is in about 30% of all elementary classrooms in the country. One other thing I'll, I'll say about that is at the center of all this, we, we didn't say this earlier, but the science of reading and teaching reading is about making meaning of text. I think a little bit that we've been 
drawn by the shiny thing of foundational skills of phonics and phonological awareness right. and decoding, which are essential parts of getting to being proficient with literacy. But the goal, the, the thing we're all chasing is students' ability to make meaning of what they read, comprehension otherwise. And that's been the sweet spot for learning A to Z and the reading A to Z products since we were born. It's all about enabling teachers to drive meaning making of text for their students efficiently with engagement and empowerment and confidence and inspiration, all these things. Like we try to drive the light bulb moments for kids. You know, those moments when they come running up to you and tug on your sleeve and say, guess what I just learned? Or did you know, did you know, did you know? Like that's the thing we want to scale. That's the thing that we think is, is the ultimate power of the classroom. And it's the thing uh, just about every teacher I've ever met says is the reason they went into this in the first place. Yeah, for sure. Because too, those moments are oftentimes what the kids remember right. throughout their learning yeah. time yeah. as well. Yeah. The things they discover yeah. on their own. Yeah, for sure. Whether it's on their own or prompted or whether they can't yeah. tell the difference, it doesn't really matter. If yeah. Once that light bulb goes on, it's a virtuous cycle. And kids yeah. who see themselves as capable readers tend to read more mm -hmm. and kids that read more tend to become more capable readers. And that's that cycle that we want to engender. And it comes through building knowledge, background knowledge for kids so that they can comprehend what they're reading. It comes through discussion and close reading and tapping into interests, whether it's narrative text or expository text, all those things will appeal to kids at different times in their, in their days and in their lives. But that's what we're after. It's that meaning making of text. And the science of reading is squarely about that. Yeah. And there is research about driving meaning making, and there is research about the most important ingredients in that recipe. And it's not just limited to foundational skills. If you like this podcast, check out our latest, Minds Over Media, a collaboration between Soida and the University of Cincinnati, delving into diverse aspects of media literacy. Uncover the power of media literacy through insightful conversations and gain valuable insight from esteemed scholars and dedicated educators navigating this complex landscape. Check it out on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Yeah. Are there any sort of interest type surveys connected to any of the products? So the, the product is organized to, to make uh, content discoverable by topic and by theme. And so that, you know, whether the teacher is teaching a unit on mm -hmm. some topic or reading as a whole group, a story on some topic, she can find related, related topics at grade level for their students that they can she can choose to assign or the kids can choose to find to keep that thread pulled through really tightly because there are just so many resources. I mean, we've spent the last 20 years building up this library of content. So there's some amazing, amazing resources and they're both in quantity and quality. Nice. I love that fiction and nonfiction and I'm sure. And all the spaces in between. In between. And yes. <laughs> yeah. When you, when you go down the levels, when you go down to, to easier levels of reading, there's a lot of genre bending, you know, there's things mm -hmm. that sound like expository text, but are narrative mm -hmm. and vice versa. And we certainly want kids to be well-versed in the elements of those genres so that they can kind of understand the distinctions between them and set purposes for reading and so forth. And you'll find the entire gamut in our collection. For sure. Well, and ultimately too, you want them to discover kind of what they enjoy what types of books or texts they enjoy reading. At any given moment, uh, you know, when you're around young kids, you know that those things, they change and they spike and they ebb and they flow. And, you know, you're always more successful at reading about something you're interested in at any given moment. We always want to have those points of entry for kids. Positive learning outcome, outcomes for kids in classrooms can't be optimized, can't be maximized without outstanding teachers. Yeah. And so we have a responsibility at Learning A to Z as a company, as a society, as policymakers to, to support teachers' excellence, to give them what they need in terms of the resources and the training and, and the, the backing, you know, the support and yeah. encouragement to be all of that. So that's one thing. And the other thing is eyes on the prize for what literacy really is. 
you know, as somebody who cares deeply about this and has for a long time. And it was a little bit similar to when, when we saw the No Child Left Behind uh, initiative and everything related to it come out 20 plus years ago, where a focus on systematic explicit phonics instruction was new-ish to some people, not to everybody, and therefore it became an area of focus. And while it has to be, there's no doubt about that, I want to be really clear about it, it's possible to over-rotate. It's possible to lose sight of what the real goal is. And decoding is a critical skill for just about every single reader, especially reader of English, but it is not the ultimate goal. Mm -hmm. If all we do is create fantastic decoders, we have not done our job. And I, I want to make sure I'm doing everything I can, that my company is doing everything it can, that our field is doing everything it can to keep eyes on the prize. And that's the, the goal of having kids become excellent and making meaning of the text that they read everywhere. So this isn't yeah. just about storybooks. This is not even just about books. Right. This yeah. is about all the texts that they encounter in the world and technology being what it is, media being what it is. Most of the reading that we do isn't in storybooks. I, you know, it's, it's probably pretty obvious to people how important it is to be able to comprehend the stuff that isn't, you know, the information you encounter online, the information you encounter in other areas of media. That's a, it's a big job. It's an important job. It's kind of a mission critical job. And we, we can't, we can't lose sight of that as the, as the, the ultimate goal for literacy. Those are the two big things, teachers in the middle, and it's about comprehension. Yeah. Which are definitely all important because I think too, with a lot of the talk with AI, yeah. you know, teachers get nervous. People are scared. They're going to lose their jobs, right? We're going to become obsolete. Yeah, we're thinking a lot about AI lately and what it can do and not do. I've had uh, a couple opportunities to talk to folks about it. And AI is fundamentally uh, an automation tool. Mm -hmm. uh, it enables processes like content development to be automated, just like lots of other things in our own right. histories have become automated. Uh, one extreme example I like to use is I don't need to know how to churn butter anymore got done in such a way that I can get that done for me pretty quickly and I don't need to know how to do it. Did we lose something as a society as a result of that? Arguably. I don't mean to diminish what AI can automate, but in principle, it's, it's kind of similar. It still requires brilliant critical thinking to decide what it is you mm -hmm. want to ask the AI to do, to prompt it to do those things, and then to make sure it did the right thing. So there's the before and after what AI, generative AI anyway, can do for us that we're not anywhere close to replacing with technology. Right. And it's gonna, so we have to look at, we have to look at AI just like any other technology as an empowerment tool and harness it rather than, than as a threat. I mean, in my mm -hmm. opinion, you're sort of tilting at windmills if you try to right. deny it. And it can be a really powerful thing. I get asked every once in a while, do you think it's gonna allow kids to cheat on their assignments? And my answer is, if you give them an assignment on which they can use AI to do the work, then yes, yeah. but don't do that. Yeah. Uh, make sure you craft your assignment carefully so that uh, AI is either intentionally incorporated or, or, or can't be. It's sort of like if you're doing fact, fact families or, or time tests in math and you tell kids they can use their calculators. Well, that, that doesn't help you to accomplish your purpose at all. And obviously nobody would do that. The same things hold with any technology, including generative AI. Don't don't ask your kids to write an essay about the life cycle of a frog for homework unless you tell them explicitly, I want you to use AI to do it, do it three times and then decide which one you like best and why. Mm -hmm. That's that's a you know kind of a way you can incorporate the technology and still see a valuable learning objective attached to it. Yeah, exactly. It's about building those like higher order skills. Right like the oh. critical thinking and the evaluating. Generative AI may automate content creation in some mm -hmm. cases for kids in schools. And we'll have to get to a place where we realize when, how, why we want to allow that to be the case and when not. And will we lose some skills along the way? Possibly. And we mm -hmm. have to decide as a society what we want to do about that. It's like reading an analog clock or Roman numerals. You know, these things are also re writing in cursive in some cases. They're, they're going away. And are they things we can't afford to lose or not? Those are the discussions we're having. 
all great concepts and takeaways. Thanks for listening to our For the Love of EdTech podcast. We hope you enjoyed our conversation today and learned something that you can use with your own students. You can find the show notes, resources, and more at www.fortheloveofedtech.org. For Love of EdTech is produced by SOIDA, the Southwestern Ohio Instructional Technology Association, in partnership with ThinkTV and CET, the local PBS stations in Dayton and Cincinnati. 